Without further ado, the smartest guy in the room, well, way smarter than me, uh, David Brent has all the answers uh, for a deeper dive into cybersecurity. So it's all you, buddy. Hoorah. Hey, hi. All right. So the last session, we had a good time. We asked some questions. I figured out that nobody knows any of my movie references. That's a sign that you're getting really old. So if we didn't know, October, oh my gosh, drum roll plays. October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Now, I didn't know why, and we're going to talk about doing research. We are going to do a little hands-on in this class, but I figured out why after doing I actually use this thing called Google Dorks to find out why October, and we're going to talk about Google Dorks in a little while, how you could do massive searches for personal information on Google. And I found out why October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And I also figured out who's been calling me about my extended car warranty. That is why, never mind. So you didn't get that joke either. Okay. So here's the deal. The reason this is important, we talked about all the stuff that you could do, you know, that we lock a camera down, all that good stuff. So in, while I'm doing my masters, I, I sort of focus on our industry. And the catch on this is if you don't follow the news and you're not on Cyber Daily and you don't get stuff from uh, Recorded Future and all that good, Sands Institute, IoT devices, right now there's about 35 point, what does it say? 8 billion IoT devices on the internet, right? It is the new way to attack someone. They're IoT devices. Now, the problem is that's supposed to double in the next three to five years. That's a lot of devices. Now, in the cyber class that we talked about earlier, we go over a thing called Shodan. Has anybody ever heard of Shodan.io? What we'll do is we'll take a little perusal of Shodan.io in a few minutes. But it's like a giant scanner and it scans the entire internet for every IP address that's out there about once every two weeks. So if you go home and you find out what your IP address is, I guarantee if you go to Shodan, it'll come up and it will tell you your exact location, what ports are open on your home router and all that good stuff, right? Because that's, that's what we do, right? Now, the big thing about this is, is that when I'm doing an IoT attack, and there's a couple of phrases, and we're going to stay really high level on this, but I'm going to show you how easy it is to gather information. <clears throat> You're going to see that IoT attack, besides the initial access, there's this really cool thing here called lateral movement. Now, in the class that I teach, we talk about what the actual attack vector and your priorities are for your video system. And one of the things that we talk about is, is that technically if I look at live video, that's really not that big of a deal because if I'm an attacker and I get in your system, do I really care about your live video? If I get into your system and I actually do a Wireshark capture, I can't play that video back in Wireshark because Wireshark doesn't know how to put back together a GOP. But the big thing is, is if I can weaponize your camera anyway, and it doesn't matter if it's a cross-site scripting attack, if I can manipulate the video that you're recording at the edge or anything else, that's the problem. If I weaponize your camera, because if I've got a network and I've got 200, cam or 200 computers and I've got the best AV software in the world, but then I've got 125 cameras with no AV software on them hanging on your walls, you've actually got all those devices that could technically be pointed back at you and you could w I could weaponize those to actually attack your system. Make sense? Now, with that being said, social engineering. Now, we just found out that October is Cyber Awareness Month, right? Can you believe how fast this year is going? It's like Christmas, almost, like, like literally, like in a month and a half. Who, who's got kids? Who's ready for Ho-Ho to come? Nobody, nobody does Ho-Ho anymore, man. So when you were a kid and they told you Santa Claus didn't exist, how did you feel? It hurt. It hurt. You know why? Because your parents are the, or social engineers and you were socially engineered. Think about it. You were told something and you believed it. I told my kids there was a ho-ho and they believed it because I socially engineered them. So my question is, who in this class 
thinks they're immune to social engineering. Everybody's like, okay, all right. So now I, I, I'm prefacing this with the fact that, you know, a lot of times you think social engineering is like, ah, oh, you know, hey man, how you doing? And yada, 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 and I get a little bit of information. The problem with social engineering is, is it is typically internal employees. Now I got a question, does anybody know who this guy is? No. Okay, so this guy's name is Stanley. This is Social Engineering 101. The problem with Social Engineering is that people are nice. I, I literally looked at him and I said, man, how was it when your parents told you Santa Claus didn't exist? He's like, hey, man, it hurt, man. He just told me everything I want to know because you trust me. You're a nice person. This guy was a contractor, walked in and out of this bank in California in 1978 every day for six months. First name basis, used to bring donuts to the receptionist, was in and out of their international transfer room. Every day they would hang the transfer code for international transfers on the wall. And one day he walked in, he memorized the code, and he had already set up a bank in Zurich. He walked out, he made two phone calls. He said, hey, this is Tom from the New York office. I need to make a transfer from this bank to that bank. And with two phone calls, he took $10.2 million. That at the time was the largest bank heist ever, and it was with two phone calls and no gun. That is social engineering, because people are nice. Makes sense? And we all have somebody in our system somewhere that looks like this, correct? It's that technician, it's that guard that doesn't get any money, and there are these three little things in cybersecurity called the three Bs. Bribery, burglary, and blackmail. And if I can get to you, if I can socially engineer you for anything else, there's somebody in your system I can get to. And if does anybody know who Kevin Mitnick is? Kevin Mitnick used to be the number one most wanted hacker by the FBI. And he's got a couple of really great books, but the one thing he has said, if there is a human in front of the keyboard, he can hack the system. He just needs time. We are the weakest link, period, paragraph. If there's somebody behind the system and I can get to that person, I can get to the system. There is nothing foolproof. Now, with that being said, I typically talk about a, a, a SANS survey and every year they put it out and they come out with the top threats to an organization. The first thing I want you to see on here is the fact that ransomware is the number one attack vector that people are getting hit with right now. And does anybody subscribe to Sans News Bites? I got, I, I, got some, I got somebody actually hooked on that. That's good. So if I look at Sans News, News Bites today, it literally says Treasury reports on virtual currency and ransomware. CIS, NSA, and FBI issue black matter ransomware advisory. Ransomware is a serious, serious issue. And the reason it's serious is because all of those devices with an open Linux kernel that are hanging on your network, i.e. other vendors' cameras, are subject to ransomware. Does that make sense? Now, the other problem that you have is that the insider threats over the last two years based on using those insiders against a, a company has ri risen 31%, okay? And if we look at ransomware, just from a 21, 2021 perspective, the first half compared to last year, we have over a thousand organizations hit within the first six months. You're like, well, that can't happen to me because I'm, I'm in a DOD facility and everything's locked up. What we're gonna talk about is, is we're gonna talk about head count and what's really out there. So mo when, um, when I got out of the core, you know, there were still, you know, Johnny, you know, at the coffee shop doing his little thing with a little bit of cow, back then it was backtrack. You're not dealing with that anymore. You're dealing with a thing called an APT. Does anybody know what an APT is? Much more broader uh, group that's doing it. It is a broader group. His statement was correct. So what an APT is, when you have a threat group that has been identified, they get assigned a number. So you have APT groups, which stands for Advanced Persistent Threat. 
And these are basically nation state actors. So one of the big ones is APT28. APT28 is the organization that took down the DNC email server back in 2015, 2016, whatever it was. They are Russian based, and we know this because the source code of their malware is actually written in Russian, and all the time and date stamps for these actual applications are based on Moscow time, okay? Now, the important part about this is <clears throat> they've got really big head counts. And when I'm talking about really big head counts, it's estimated that APT28 has somewhere between 300 and 500 individuals. That's broken down in groups. That means they have one group that is specifically dedicated to social engineering. They have one group that specifically writes malware. They have one group that ha hosts malicious websites. They've got another group that actually does pen testing, which means they're launching actual ping sweeps, they're probing D, uh, DMZs, they're doing all that good stuff, right? Now the catch on this is, is since they write their own malware, and one of the things that we cover in my cyber class is hash signatures and how you know we identify malware and all that good stuff. The catch on this is, if I write a piece of any document and I have a hash value, when you do, a, when you do an AV scan on your computer, it's not checking to see if each individual file is a piece of malware, it's checking the hash signature of your files against a library that it has in its software. Now the catch is, is if I write a piece of malware and you figure it out, all I gotta do is put a period someplace or one more space and guess what happens to my hash signature? It changes. So now I've got threat actors that write their own malware and if they're detected, all they have to do to avoid the AV databases is slightly modify the code. Now, how intense is their malware? I'm going to point out one thing here. I've got a list of some of APT 28's software. And one of the things they have is a thing called Sourface. Now, what Sourface is, is a downloader. And everybody's like, well, you can't get into me. Most threat actors don't try to get in past your DMZ anymore. They're like vampires, they get you to come to them. So if I get a malicious site and I get it to you and you're like, oh man, look, I can win me a free iPad. And you go to it because you look like you want a free iPad for Christmas. All right, so what I get you to come to a malicious website and then part of the JavaScript, and we're gonna talk about cross-site scripting attacks here in a little while, I will inject a very small piece of malware in my return reply to your website and it's gonna be that little piece right there called Sourface. Now Sourface is smart enough that it will actually sense if there's AV software and it will change its signature so that it can sit on your device undetected. And then it will send out a signal and it will do what is called a C2C or, or a C2 channel, which is a command and control channel. And it will find any open ports out of your network and it will do encrypted message to then, an encrypted tunnel to then download more malware. So you're not dealing with a guy that says, oh, hey man, here's the I love you worm. It doesn't work like that anymore. It's a little bit more sophisticated. Now, if they're tired of using their own software, they are now starting to use the NSA leaks that were put out with the Vault 7 leaks a few years back because a lot of the stuff that's out there like wanna cry is based on Eternal Blue. Guess who wrote Eternal Blue? It wasn't me, but we in general, we did. It was an NSA program. It was a zero day attack that the NSA didn't tell anybody about so that they could actually use it. It got leaked with the Vault 7 leaks and guess what? Now everybody's got it. Now, one of the things that we talk about, and I, I, I kind of want to get into this, and there's a couple of things I can't demo because the Wi-Fi in this building is not letting me get out to the World Wide Web the correct way. But 90, uh, I'm going to say 9 out of 10 times, and, and, and this is legit, 70 to 80% of all hacks are done with open source information. Okay. Now the question is, how much information do you have out there? Because remember I said, I don't have to attack you directly, I can attack your employees, right? Because I can get, I, eventually I will get to someone that has access or someone that you care about. So the question is, how much of your information is on the internet? 
All right, now, just off the wall, how much information do you think your, your ISP takes, uh, uh, collects on you on a daily basis? About 600 megabytes a day per person. It's averaged between 300 and 800, but we'll take it down to 600. Now, the reason this is important is because there are tools out there, and one of the tools that we have is a tool called um, Maltigo. And what Maltigo does is it will take and it will web scrape everything that you want to know about an organization off of the web. And it's free to include all the users, the email accounts, the whole nine yards. Okay. There's another program called the Harvester, which I was going to do on mid chess during this presentation. No, 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 no. <clears throat> well, I did it at home. It was great because I got a list of everybody. And, and, and the cool part, the harvester, you can actually just say, I want to do Google, Dogpile, LinkedIn, and it will take anything off LinkedIn with Mitch Chesson and give you a nice big list. You're like, well, why do you want to do that? Because I'm, I'm going to start an attack vector and I'm going to plan this out. I want to figure out who I'm going to start my actual phishing attack against. Now, earlier, the gentleman said something about the target attack. The target attack in 2014 actually took place over a long period of time, and it was based on open source information gathering. Target had put a, a public paper out with, with Microsoft and Intel about their new virtualization of all their POS devices. And they put everything about the actual architecture and the stuff they were using in a white paper and posted it on the internet. Boom. Guess what? They also put out that all their vendors went into a portal. So one of the ways that they got into the Target Corporation was a spear phishing attack at all the vendors. And when they got to the HVAC vendor in New Jersey, they got credentials to the portal. After they got into the portal, they took about a month, they got into the SQL database, and then by Black Friday, they had all the POS devices actually infected with malware. So a hack is not just like, oh, bam, I got a sales guy in California. He always says, come out, man, and hack this camera in front of, in front of this customer. It's like, dude, you just don't hack a camera in front of it. It's, it's like a magic trick. You do preparation. You figure out what the target is. You take your time and you analyze things. We're going to see a couple things about this in a bit. Now, Here's the deal. The end result is, is if we take open source information like Shodan, and I'm going to show you what Shodan is here in about two seconds. If I take open source information like Shodan, I'm going to come over here to Shodan. And what Shodan is, I said earlier, it's like a big giant scanner of the internet. So I can literally put anything I want in here. And what's going to happen is I, I put in and it will do it by country. I'm logged in right now. I can say, I want to see all the cameras in the U.S. Now these are the devices that it actually identified in the United States and of course now I've got bad um, network connectivity. But what will happen is it will give you the IP address and it will also tell you what firmware the device is running. Now the cool part about this is if you know the device model number and you know the firmware it's running, if you were to go to some place like ExploitTacDB, you could come in, and we do this in the cyber class, and I can say, you know what? I want to see if uh, I got any vulnerabilities I can do for this particular device. And it says, oh, look, there's a, there's a remote code execution. Well, when I look at this, I can actually download the, the actual Python script that will do the execution, so I don't have to write anything. But the cool thing is, right here, it says you can look up the advisory on x.com. And then when you go there, it will give you a list of all the affected cameras by this vulnerability, including what firmware they have to be on. Oh my gosh, if I'm on Shodan, I can see all the cameras that are there and what firmware they're on. So now I can attack them because I know they're vulnerable to this particular piece of Python code. Make sense? Oorah. So I can take this information with this information and then I can take and I can weaponize stuff. One, I could do a, a botnet. I can use that platform I just got into not to even do anything with because the number one target for any hacker is just a PC that's got bandwidth. I don't care if it's a credit card machine. I'd rather get a DVR that's sitting there that I can sit and just launch software from because it's got bandwidth. 
that's important because I don't want to attack your uh, DMZ from my computer. I'd rather attack your DMZ from his DVR so that if you actually do a solar winds and you start doing a forensics trace, he's like, oh, hi, Mr. Man. I, I would like to arrest you. Never mind. I don't want to arrest you. Okay. <clears throat> so what does this actually relate to? Advanced persistent threat groups plus ransomware equals the colonial pipeline. The other day in the Washington Times, or maybe it's the New York Times, this came up. The NSA chief just said that ransomware is not going away anytime soon. Uh, I would, just in a general suggestion, if you do not subscribe to Cyber Daily and Recorded Future, I would do it because it really does shine some light on what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So is anybody besides myself and the one guy in the back on Recorded Future? No, okay. Now, I'm going, I'm going to say one more thing now. <clears throat> a lot of people think, okay, it's ransomware, it's no big deal. If you, there, there's, a, there's a young lady named Sherry Davidoff. She was, she's a MIT graduate. Her, her hacker name was The Alien, and she runs a cybersecurity company, I think, in Montana or so South Dakota. And she had a very interesting podcast, and it specifically talked about how the ransomware industry has evolved. It's really run like a business. They actually do ransomware negotiations. And it's to the point where the attackers will offer you proof of life. So if I attack your, your, your actual facility, I will have one machine that I will let you decrypt just to show you that I will decrypt. They actually have helplines because they want to make sure that you pay them because if you, you don't pay them and they just delete or you do pay them and you delete their stuff, the next person won't pay. And then a lot of people will go, well, they've got to deal with me and they've got to talk to me right now. They don't care because most ransomware groups are doing about 30 people at a time. So they'll get to you when they pick the phone up. Kind of makes sense? So if I were you, I would look at a couple of podcasts with Sherry Davidoff. Now, the reason I say it's important to stay abreast of things, how many, everybody knows what a zero day attack is, right? Everybody's got one of these, right? My question is, how many zero day attacks has Apple, Apple had since January of this year? Anybody got, anybody got an idea? How many? Three, did I hear a three? So right now, Apple has had 17 zero day attacks since January 1st. Now you're like, well, yeah, but everybody attacks Windows. Everybody attacks Windows because it's widely used. And as we've seen over the past few years, there's a paradigm shift. They're going after Android, they're going after Apple. And if we actually look at a SANS Institute forensic examination of OSs, the weakest OS on the market right now is actually Apple OS X10. It has more core, core vulnerabilities, not talking add-ons, than Windows, Microsoft, or Linux. So with that being said, the problem with this is, has anybody ever heard of an OMG cable or a rubber duck? So here's the ticket. If you don't know what a rubber duck is, it looks like a USB stick and it's got a little micro SD card in it. And you can take and you can program it with script so that when it goes into your computer, it actually runs hundreds of lines of code in a few seconds. That means I can create accounts, backdoors, and you're like, but oh, we turned off USB privileges. That doesn't matter because when I write the code, I change the PID or the physical ID of the USB stick to say it's a mouse. And guess what computers trust? Human input. So I literally can put this stick in there and I can run all kinds of crap on your computer. It's great. So, but the thing is, they got a new thing called OMG cable. And it's on the same premise as the rubber duck, except it is a specific to, spe or I should say, it fits specifications for an Apple and or an Android power cable. And in the end of this guy, I'll go ahead and just let you see this, it's got a programmable USB connector. You can put all the rubber duck code that you put on a regular thing. It's got a back door, automatic back door shell with a lock screen app. And you can connect to it through 802.1 wireless. 
So if I'm socially engineering you and I say, wow, you know what? Here's your free box with your free phone stuff. Come to our webinar and you plug it in. I own you. Make sense? And it looks just like an Apple cable or an Android cable. Now, how bad has it gotten? How bad do they want you? This is how bad they want you. In the past two months, there has been a rash of snail mail packages. Just like that with 16 gig USB sticks that says inserted is the 16 gig USB stick you just ordered. And guess what? It's loaded with all kinds of goodies. So as soon as you put it in, they once again, they own you. Okay. Now, with that being said, we're going to talk about a couple of things. And the first thing I'm going to say is that 81% of all data bre breaches are based on a weak password. So you, it's like that song, does my password start with a one or a two? Here I've got a screenshot of Maltigo. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at a program called CUP. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to open up my Kali Linux box real quick. I'm going to come in here. Does my password start with a one or a two? It's not default. <laughs> All right, so while we're waiting for this to fire up, what we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to look at a thing called Sherlock. So now the reason this is important, okay, and I'm going to just do a new terminal real quick. So we got this little thing called Sherlock, all right? And what Sherlock will do is if you're doing, um, if I want to stalk you on the internet, let's say you got a username, we'll I, just make up a username like you're on some blog trying to find out what happened with a shell script. And in the blog you say, well, I work at this DOD facility and I do this and your username comes up on the blog and we'll say it's, um... and now here's the thing, you could download this program, but the Sherlock project actually will come up and say, would you like to run this in the Google cloud? So you don't even have to install it and it's free. I can literally come in here and say, and it will come in and it will check that username on every social media site on the internet. Holy crap, Batman, this is getting scary. And we're gonna hit enter and we'll actually have something come up here. Okay, so right here we see that we are checking. Uh, wow, let's see, we got on seven cups, nine gag, uh, independent academics archive.org basically if there's a user account out there and I don't have to actually spend any money to find it I can just track you down now what we want to do real quick is we're going to come back to here now what cup is cup is a commonly used password generator which means if I'm going to socially engineer you and I know something about you I can automatically generate a list of possible passwords that you will use and it's based on you personally. So I don't have to go out and get the rock you list off Linux or anything like that. I'm just going to come in here like this real quick. I'm going to go CD root cup and we're gonna hit enter and we're going to go Python three uh, and we're going to go cup dot pi tack I. All right. So what this will do is, is it will take and it will generate a personalized password list. And now that I have a personalized password list and I have all the user accounts that you have out on the web, I can now start trying to break your passwords. Make sense? Okay. So real quick, we're going to talk about two things real quick. Has anybody ever heard the term, uh, believe half of what you see, nothing of what you hear? Now, I'm, I'm going to say the irony on this because somebody told me that was Mark Twain. And I wanted to use it in this presentation, so I did some research. And then the web said it was Ben Franklin. But then when I really researched it, it wasn't Ben Franklin. It was Edgar Allan Poe. So I can't believe anything I hear, and I only got half of what I saw. Make sense? Now, the reason I'm saying this is because they're, while people are actually catching up, they are using a little bit of sleight of hand to say, look, our crap's really secure. We took all these menus out. So if I take an, a, one of the newer cameras that I got into my lab and I do a burp suite test on it and it says, oh, all the menus are gone. You can't get to this. Guess what I find in the background? All the menus are still there. 
And it says, oh, by the way, these pages have been deprecated and eventually they'll be removed. That's crap because they're still there. The other thing I got is, and I'll, I'll say this really quick, it's another A company and they are very, very adamant in saying, our stuff is so secure you can't even scan it. But that's not true. Because if you really look at it and you know the actual password of the device, it's subject to brute force. And when you brute force it, it will come up and it will say that it has six cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in it they also say you can't get to our video, but there's a sleight of hand here because what happens is, is they will take and they'll make two partitions on their recording media. They'll make a Windows partition and a Linux partition. And on the Windows partition, they have the player and the player will access the stuff on the Linux partition. So if you take the card out, guess what is sitting unencrypted on the Linux partition? A good old MP4 file, non-encrypted, okay? And the real beast about this is, and we're going to talk about cross-site scripting really quick. So does everybody understand what HTML is? HTML means that every web page in the world is made with HTML. So I come in here and everything that's in between these two things is what you see on the page. What, what cross-site scripting does is if I'm using Java, if I put in the middle of this script and script, this executes and doesn't show on a page. That means if I put a script into the page, I'm a bad guy, and you connect, you're the victim, that script could say, by the way, I want you to upload this file from me or this script from me, or I want you to go to a different website. That's cross-site scripting 101. Now the problem with this is, is that if a company says that they can't be brute force, and we're gonna do this real quick, this company right here that says we're really secure, you can't turn off their HTTP web page. That means if I'm using something like Legion, I can brute force it. Now, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so what I did was this. I've got this nice little program here that I wrote in Python, and it's a little brute force FTP test tool. So I'm gonna run it real quick. And when it comes up, it's gonna say, enter your target's IP address. So what I'm going to do, I got a little camera down here. I'm going to go 192.168.1.242. And it's going to scan to see if the ports that I really want are up. 20, 21, 22, yada, yada, yada. It says confirm. I'm going to confirm. And then it's going to say, what's the username? Well, I already know the username because I did open source information gathering and I know all the default names on a camera. If I think the tech put his name on it, I've already got his name because I did an open source information with the Sherlock project and I've just created a password list with cup that will take all the possible passwords he can put in, right? So I'm going to say for giggles because we got to do this quick, I'm going to do root. Then it's going to say, where's your password list? We're going to go C colon backslash. I better make that a little C. C colon backslash password dot text. So this is going to go through the entire password list that I have there. Now, what I did with this program is that if I get the password list and I, re and I get the password out of the list, I enter it, it will create a reverse shell and it will put a file back onto the target. So that way, I don't have to actually do anything tr too tricky. I just have the program do it. So if I can do this, what do you think a group like APT28 can do when they've got an entire group of programmers that actually know how to program? Right? Kind of, kind of scary maybe, just a little bit. So let's see if this thing comes up with anything. So while this is running, do we have any questions? Yes, no, indifferent. I should have used a shorter list. Oh, check it out. All right, so my password's pass. I'm gonna go pass, I'm gonna hit enter. And if I were to actually look at the temp file on this device, you would see that I passed a file and that file was go down here to the bottom, I passed another Python file, which was the Python FTP2 file. So, summation. You're not as safe as you think you are. You need to register for a couple of things and start getting a, like informed of what's going on. No questions? Going once, going twice. Hoorah.